Okay, so my name is Adam Torrens and I'm from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Uh, I grew up uh, in the country and beside the beach. My dad was a, a principal, my mum was a teacher, so I grew up certainly in education. My, my house growing up was actually in the school grounds. So I uh, used to help my mum and dad quite a bit and eventually got a computer and played around with the computer and got into graphic design. Uh, started started a little bit of interest in graphic design and kept that interest in teaching and and uh, at one point in my life steered towards graphic design and then uh, heard about all the VLEs that were coming out and all the platforms that were coming out for students. So then I took a sidestep and went into education and and uh, continued my love of technology and education. So ended up coming to Singapore to teach kindergarten, used technology quite a lot and then uh, ended up in uh, a role in ed tech or digital learning as we call it here. Yeah, a lot of people that I worked with uh, in, the, in the Sunshine Coast had worked in Singapore previously. So as soon as I got the job there, I guess everyone was telling me at some point I need to come to Singapore and try it out. And, and in 2011, I came over. My brother was living in Singapore and, and I was visiting him quite often and had the urge to move over here and, and ended up uh, running into a university friend who was working at Stanford American International School in Singapore. So we got talking and... Uh, set me up with an interview there. So I uh, had the interview and yeah, came over. And uh, best decision of my life. Met a girl here, got married, and and uh, I think I'll be here for the rest of my life. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the Singapore system is quite uh, different to, to the international system, uh, the curriculum and the way the pedagogy is approached. Uh, Stanford American International School is quite uh, powerful because we have a standards-based curriculum and we're an IB school. So we mix both the IB and the Aero standards, which is the American Education Reaches Out standards. Um, very similar to the Common Core that are found within America but it has an, an outward focus. It recognizes that you're not in the US. Uh, so balancing that when we plan as teachers where you can have concrete standards that you can map out and have good scope and sequences and have kids meet certain standards at certain grade levels, mixing that in with the IB curriculum and the PYP in, in the elementary school and having students really think about which actions they should take and, and, and who they should help and what they should think about so blending the two, I guess, traditional standards with the IB uh, curriculum is a good mix for everyone at our school. Um, it's quite, it's quite uh, different in paper, but once you get good pedagogy, once you get the, a lot of teachers talking and planning, you'll find that it mixes quite nicely. A lot of our teachers, surprisingly, here are from Australia. And uh, quite surprisingly, a lot of them are from Queensland around my hometown. So there's not much of a transition period to go from um, the Australian curriculum into the IB. And that could probably be mostly that we are a standards-based school as well. Um, but what we end up do finding is the open-ended projects, these, these passion projects that the kids take and, and really getting them to dive into the community, thinking about what they what changes they want to create and, and what action they want to take. That is the one area that's a little bit different to uh, what we were doing in Australia with the Australian curriculum. Yeah, there's been quite a few. So we work with uh, everyone from kindergarten to grade 12. Uh, some of the ones that stand out are definitely the tech-focused ones for me because we, we work so heavily in the tech world. Uh, we had some students last year really diving into the UN Global Goals. So we had a group of girls who were in grade four. And now uh, that was last year. Now they're in grade five. They are developing a, an application that connects different generations together so it's really helping the, the older generation that is feeling 
um, maybe feeling a little bit lonely, maybe don't have people who they can talk to at, uh, at certain times of the day. And these girls are working with one of our ed tech coaches uh, from last year, uh, Heather Bernard, who uh, are developing this application where it can connect young students to the older generation and having the younger students, I guess, teach the older generation uh, different tools and different tasks. And the older generation is having that opportunity to really talk and meet and learn technology from these uh, younger students. So that's one that stands out and it's, it's still going. So it's, uh, yeah, hopefully you'll hear a lot about it in the coming weeks and months. So at our school, it's almost like our motto. We keep saying creation-based app versus content-based app. Uh, there used to be a big argument in schools. It was educational games versus games. So we would look at apps very closely and say, was that an educational game or is that just a, a game that has no educational value? So I guess we've moved quite past that now and we really are focusing on what's the difference between a creation-based app and a content-based app. Uh, the common saying around our school is a content-based app is either a babysitting app or a tap-tap app, as we call them where the student will sit there and just tap on different things. Um, we don't really want to replace teachers at all. We don't really want to have students learning from the tablet or learning from the iPad because we are a one-to-one -one iPad school and we certainly don't want to take anything away from the teachers. So what we are really pushing is having creation-based apps only on the iPad. That way students can show their work, connect with other students, and they're not really learning anything directly from the iPad, not learning content from the iPad. Yeah, so the go-to for us is always Keynote. Keynote is quite, quite an amazing app for us. We find that we can do a lot of work, share a lot of work on there. So we really encourage students to, to jump on that as often as they can. Uh, all the Apple applications are great, Keynote, Pages, Numbers, Clips, and iMovie, uh, we really promote. And then there's some other apps that we love out there like Stop Motion. Um, we also use Green Screen by Do Inc, which is a very popular one. Hopscotch is great for coding as well as uh, Swift and, um, and Scratch Junior. We really get the students onto those, that way they can, they can almost have like a template-free platform where they can create uh, what they need to need to show or need to teach other other students. Yeah, it, it really does. Uh, when we start looking at inquiring about the topics that matter to the students and what they feel is important. Uh, and then we give them a few guidelines. They really have an open, an open array of choice about what they, how they want to target that uh, passion project. Uh, we often ask the students to tie it to the UN Global Goals because that way we're ensuring that you know there's a positive action in place and there's not some, not some ulterior motives there. They're really, really keeping it positive, really keeping the focus on not helping themselves but helping other people. And from there, they look at the applications after they really want to find out what they want to do and who they want to help. Then they come into the applications and they choose the creative base app that really um, uh, assists what they want to do. So that way they can look at the barriers that those apps have, what it can do, what it can't do, and then they make that choice. If it's a more advanced application, if they're really looking into deep coding, then we have systems in place where we can um, have uh, consultants come in and speak to those students and get that global collaboration going so they can talk to other students or other teachers or professionals in the field. And we encourage them to, to come on into the school and speak to our students as well. So it's really powerful. If it's in the kids' minds, then it can be on the screen. And that's what we really want from our students to bring their, uh, bring their ideas to life. Yeah, over the moon we have we had another example where a group of students were uh, got into hopscotch and had a very basic game where they had, wanted to clean up water. So the water looked dirty and they had uh, minerals in the water and they had diseases in the water and they just go through and tap the diseases and, and clean up the water. And then we, uh, 
got in touch with uh, Serlio. Uh, they're, a, they're a company that works with uh, the HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens, and they develop augmented reality applications. So they transferred his app into an augmented reality app for, for this group of students. And the, the programmer that we had in grade four transferred his code into the augmented reality app. And putting the helmet onto these kids, even though you know they're a couple of years too shy of augmented reality, but we gave them 15 minutes on the headset and they, their minds were just blown about seeing their creation in an augmented reality setting. So that was, that was a really good moment for them. Yeah, we do. We we were working with Serlio, the company, to to develop applications and have students develop applications with them. And we had a bit of a meeting to talk about, you know, what age group this is perfect for and the different reasonings. And we didn't dive too much into the research. We just looked at our curriculum, looked at our um, how busy the students were, and we made the choice that let's keep them developing VR uh, in the elementary school and let's have them using uh, AR in the high school. So as soon as we made that decision, we kind of stuck with that rule. Um, so we said uh, augmented reality should be for 13 and up. And we had a bit of a conversation with the uh, Thurlio developers as well about which, which age group is, is ideal for them. They do, they do. We have a group of tech experts in grade four and five and we, uh, we give them a little peek into what the augmented world looks like and uh, and they're really wanting to to jump on there and start developing some applications. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when we heard about uh, Everyone Can Create, we were so excited about it. It, it really complements what we're doing at Stanford American International School. We, uh, because technology is so big, it's not just the iPad, it's tech tools, it's even the pencil and paper. Technology is just is so huge. Uh, we really had to have a transition year where we gave the iPad to the teachers and we, and we pretty much said to the classroom teachers, you know, you're, you're responsible for this technology now. Um, and that was quite a scary thought for a lot of teachers because there was no framework in place to actually start integrating it effectively. Previously, we had ICT classes where students would, would have an ICT teacher and, and teach them skills. So when we kind of left that concept and started thinking more about um, integrating into every subject, it was a big transition and a big mindset change for a lot of people because uh, a lot of people, I guess, relied on the ICT teacher to teach those skills. So everyone can create is a great complement to the, the model that we're doing now where we can actually give advice through the everyone can create. And we're seeing a lot of teachers just really embrace this and show uh, teach their students some, some great tech skills using, using that curriculum. Yeah, just keeping everything simple. Uh, uh, we, we were kind of forced to go away from the classroom because our school just gets so big. Singapore just keeps growing and growing. So we didn't have the numbers in the, in the ed tech department to actually visit every class um, as often as we could or as often as we wanted to. So that mixed in with how simple the iPads have become, how simple the apps that Apple have created have become. Uh, that's what really started getting people on side that, that a lot of teachers can just open up an application and give the students a task. And then the students really don't have any issue creating a lot of things. Um, they just need exposure. So we create tutorials based on everyone can create and based on some of the common applications that we, we want to share out in our school. But getting the teachers focused on a few creation-based apps instead of opening up the app world to, to everybody really uh, built that confidence as well. We keep saying at our school, We've got 1,500 Minecraft experts, but we don't have a uh, Minecraft teacher. So the kids, kids can learn pretty quickly.
Yeah, exactly. That that whole idea of the teacher knows all is, is certainly certainly gone, uh, especially in Singapore. And 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 the students feel so confident about teaching their teachers new tricks. For me, it's definitely the, the video, the video book. Uh, video is just a powerful tool in the world, especially now, uh, where it used to be a lot of articles were being posted online for people to do their own personal PD on. It's now videos. People naturally go to videos. When you look at statistics on social media about how many people are reading articles versus videos, the videos are just uh, are blowing up in a big way. Uh, it, five years ago, it was really impressive that a six-year-old could create, uh, take a video and take a self-reflection. But now it's 2018, and it's a, a bit of a basic skill to take a video for, for six-year-olds these days. Uh, and what we found at our school is the, the video quality that a six-year-old was taking and the video quality that a, a person just going into high school was taking was quite similar. Uh, and, it, and it shouldn't be. Video is a skill and creating video videos and reflections and that YouTube kind of YouTuber um, quality video, they are skills that the students develop. So having the students really think about what they're doing when they're videoing and what type of videos they're making, to me, that's really important. Um, the, the reason we make a lot of videos in our school are to teach other people. We're teaching our students so that they can teach a, a wider audience outside of their classroom. So the idea of, of the video skills being in everyone can create is really powerful and, and it'll explode around quite quickly. Yeah, and you, you don't want to go, for me, I wouldn't go into the everyone can create book and then start generating ideas from that. I would spend a little bit of time going through each of the books and just getting a little bit familiar with yourself because then uh, when you're teaching the students or when you're planning to teach the students a concept, you'll have those natural links about uh, the, the, the content or the idea that you want to teach the students. Then you'll start thinking about things that are in the Everyone Can Create books and say, you know what, that skill is perfect for this task. Uh, as opposed to saying, you know, I want these students to create a logo and, and getting them to create a logo that really doesn't have any meaning to them. You don't want to do it backwards. You want to bring the learning first and then go into the books and find out which complements the learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think so. And I, for me, I having that curriculum visible to students is very important. Uh, it's a big ask to try and get teachers to start coding and start thinking about um, their coding skills because, you know, essentially we've been teaching for uh, thousands of years and we've never needed coding. These students feel the importance of coding and a lot of teachers do, but to try and get a whole faculty into coding practices is a, is a big ask. So these books, what, I, what we really need to start doing is giving them to the students and really get the students to be in charge of their own learning as well. Because if we can expose a little bit of coding to our students and teach them a few skills, when the students have access to these books or get to see these books, they will really take things in a new direction, especially if we give them a bit of wiggle room of creativity in their, I guess, assessments that we give them. So if we can if we can give them a few um, minutes a week to say you know go into those books and create something based on the task that you are required to complete, they're the ones that are going to be learning about coding. They're the ones that are going to be pushing ahead. So for me, it's definitely these books complement what the kids are doing so well. Uh, if we find that teachers are not embracing them as well as we should, then let's give them straight to the students and see what they come up with.
yeah, definitely. These, these students learn so quickly. Uh, we didn't have many teachers in our school know coding at all, and I was certainly quite new to it. And we've had students putting apps on the App Store. We've had students, um, like I said, having them on the Microsoft HoloLens, their applications, and, and they never had a coding teacher. They, they just briefly have a look at Hopscotch. They got a little bit creative. We gave them a bit of time to be creative on Hopscotch and on, uh, on different applications, and they just really took off. And then we used the students then to create tutorials for more students so you can have a, a big coding curriculum in your school and actually have no teacher who's familiar with coding. So being an AD has been very beneficial to not only myself, but, but uh, teachers around the school. One of the things it's done is it streamlined our app process. Uh, we, had, we had hundreds and hundreds of applications in our school and it was very difficult for the students to get their head around applications because they would they would only look at certain apps very in very small times of the day and, and maybe not revisit the same application. So being an ADE and working closely with Apple, it's really helped us because we're able to pick out these creation-based apps and, and only have like a, a dozen of them and really have the students hone their skills in there and make sure that we're focused on transdisciplinary skills rather than learning an application. Uh, so that's the biggest thing that I think the ADE has has helped me. The other thing is just the connections. You know, if we need something at our school, if we need some knowledge to be shared, if we need some resources, the ADE community is just a such a caring and supporting community that they'll reach out to us within minutes. Uh, something that used to take weeks and weeks of organisation to try and pair up two classes. Honestly, we can we can pair up two classes within half an hour now with the ADE community. They're such a great community to be involved with. The reason why they're powerful to me is, is a lot of them are template free, which means the students really have to start building from scratch. They have to start thinking about what background colors they're going to use, what fonts they're going to use, and they really bring in that design process and, and speak to the audience. Uh, and that's what we really want to see. We want to see students just really 100% creating with those applications rather than just filling in templates. Um, there are hundreds and thousands of great apps on the app store and we every day we hear can we get this app it's great can we get that that app it's great but honestly they're all great and we just want to have just some transdisciplinary skills and think about the skills that they need in life rather than the skills that they need on the ipad so presentation skills collaboration skills communication skills and really thinking about those skills when the students are on the on the ipad and that's what helps us choose which applications are best for them Yeah, we, we love it. They don't update, the updates are, are beautiful as well. We, we always get frustrated coming back after a new school year and, and the applications have had updates that are just completely different than the year before. We felt like we've lost a year of, of work, but the Apple apps are, are fantastic. Their, their updates are small and they complement the, the last version. Yeah, so obviously, uh, as stated, I work at Stanford American International School in Singapore, and mostly I'm on Twitter. So if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at A Torrens, A T O R R E N S 84. And uh, I often share resources up there, so feel free to contact me. Also, if you want to jump onto uh, Asia Ed Chat, it's, it's a great chat for. Uh, everything about education in Asia. So that's on Tuesday, 7.30 Singapore time, Thursday, uh, sorry, Tuesday night, Singapore time, and that's the uh, hashtag Asia Ed. Yeah, the hashtag's SAIS rocks. Jump on there. We've got dozens and then I think maybe nearly 100 teachers on there just sharing what they're doing in the classroom every day. So 
So jump on there at any point of time and you'll see some great ideas being shared out. No, it's fantastic, thank you. Yeah, well, good luck with everything and thank you so much for uh, having me on. All right, you too, bye.